Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Tortilla Mexican Grill PLC Half Year Results Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged. They can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab that's just situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Please just simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so and these will be available via your Investor Meet company dashboard. Before we begin, I would like to submit the following poll and I would now like to hand you over to the executive management team from Tortilla Mexican Grill. Uh, Richard, Andy, good afternoon. Uh, hi, good afternoon, Jake. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Okay, um, and thanks for joining us. Uh, we'll take you through our presentation. We think probably half an hour, 40 minutes, something like that. Um, but first of all, a quick intro to ourselves. Uh, my name's Richard Morris. I am, I'm led to believe a hospitality veteran. Um, I've been in this sector all my, all my uh, working life, actually, from uh, flipping burgers at McDonald's as a kid through TGI Fridays, um, lot five restaurants, and then I joined Tortilla um, just about 10 years ago, actually, or nearly, nearly 10 years ago. So it's been a, a, an interesting career and a, been a very exciting last 10 years with this business. Hi, everyone. I'm Andy. I'm the CFO at Tortilla. I've been here about six years, um, having worked in um, another restaurant business, Gaucho, before. I was a, uh, I started my career in oil and gas. It's a very different industry, an accountant by background. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, moved into a more of a commercial role in recent years. And um, yeah, we, we, uh, we have a great management team here. Um, okay, so flipping on to the um, first slide, and we thought we'd talk you through the um, highlights of the, the half year and uh, where we were at and what we were up to. So strategic and operational highlights for the business. Um, well, we made some good progress on our UK news store openings. Um, so far, actually, year to date, we've opened five, including our first site in Northern Ireland, which has been hugely successful and very exciting. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. But um, so suffice to say that site openings have gone well. Um, we also have a slide on our Chilango acquisition, which we made in uh, May last year. Um, some updates on that business. Our franchise network uh, with SSP, Compass, and our franchise partner in the Middle East with Ethos. Some little updates on those. Um, most encouragingly, it looks as though cost pressures are starting to ease. We say that quietly because we never know, but as we sit here today, we are sensing that things are moving in the right direction for, uh, <coughs> for a change. So we're very excited about that. Um, we've also launched a couple of major tech projects for the business. Um, our first kiosk-only site um, in London Wall, which again we can talk about in a bit more detail later on, and a nationwide rollout of a delivery order aggregation software because we are a multi-platform business um, with what was before lots of different screens, lots of different printers. We've now managed to sort of consolidate it all through, uh, through a business called Deliverect. Uh, which is making life a lot easier for us and, and far better from a customer and an employee standpoint. So that's good news. Um, you'll hear me talk a lot in this presentation about Tortilla Sunsets, one of the most exciting promotions we've ever done, um, and we have just launched it. So we will uh, give you a little bit more detail about what that is later on. Um, we've talked in the past, for those of you that have joined this before, around European opportunities for us. Uh, just a, 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 you know, a few comments that we'll talk about that as we go through the presentation, still something we're very keen on, something that we are uh, keen to pursue. Um, and from a personnel perspective, we've strengthened our board with um, um, a gentleman by the name of Keith Down, who's joined us as our non-exec director. He comes with a raft of experience. He was uh, ex-CFO of uh, Selfridges and, and also Weatherspoons. Uh, is currently the chair of Tops Tiles. So he's been with us um, about a month now and will be a fantastic addition to the business and is already proving to be very helpful. And a small round of applause, or a large round of applause for Andy uh, sitting on my right, who uh, we've recently promoted up to the role of MD 
um, fully deserved in his six years in the business. He's um, obviously moved from FD to CFO and has also been heavily involved in a lot of commercial work that we've been doing over the last few years. So um, delighted to say that he's Thank moved you. into that role. <laughs> um, on the financials, I'll kind of leave those to, for Andy to talk through on his on his pages, uh, as, as he's got quite a lot of um, as he's got quite a lot of notes on the on all the financials. So we'll, we'll flip over to those now. So on to the uh, the exciting bit, the numbers. Uh, some headlines here, which we, we dive into all these points in sort of more detail. But some of the, the headlines to hit those: we had a significant year-on-year -year increase in revenue just over 20%. Um, most of that was new store driven, but there's some good life to life growth in there as well. Um, and obviously the addition of the Chilango business last year. Um, gross profit margin uh, was remained at 77%, which is the same as the prior year number, although actually on an underlying basis, it was 0.7% better because the prior year number benefited from some VAT support. Admin expenses increased in line with revenue growth, uh, and the EBITDA of 1.8 million is, is pretty much bang on um, where we expect it to be at the end of the half year. Um, the reduction in the um, number versus the prior was entirely driven by um, 1.1 million of government support in the prior year number. So I'll we'll come on to the bridge around that um, just now. Revenue wise, lots to say on this. So 22% increase, which equates to 5.8 million. Um, you'll see that all of the bars go upwards except the VAT benefit difference. And that was just as a reminder in Q1 last year, there was a 12.5% VAT rate that was applied to hot food. That obviously wasn't in the, in the current year. So in the lapping that um, was, it was uh, something that moves the number down. But then it's all up from there. And the new store openings and Obviously, all the tremendous growth the business has been through has been um, adding a lot to the top line. There's a, a breakdown in the bottom right-hand corner of the slide around where the 4.9 million comes from. Um, so 2.5 million of that comes from sites that were opened um, at the open post um, H1 in the prior year. We also bought the Chilanga business in May last year. So there was only five weeks of trading in the comparative. So obviously lapping that with a full Full 26 weeks in the in the in the in the current year means a significant increase. Obviously, additionally to that, the revenue from the prior year openings. Obviously, last year openings happened at various stages during the half. So the full year number um, was the full period. So there's an extra 1.2 million from that. And then the only thing going downwards on that was we shut some cloud kitchens, which was a consequence of the Chilango acquisition. They had some loss making. Uh, cloud kitchens that we decided to shut down as part of the acquisition and then also we shut some of our own because the delivery market significantly contracted over the last 12 18 months um, they were marginally um, uh, profitable so we decided to close those um, on to a bit around the like the likes so we continue to outperform the industry benchmark the cga coffer weekly data so we posted a five percent like for like growth and the peach reported at 4.6, the CGA peach 4.6. And um, I guess what we what we also wanted to point out on this really is that there's good growth coming from both the in-store and delivery revenue streams, which at the moment, considering the contraction of the delivery market, it's a fantastic result that we managed to generate some growth. And, and that's largely because we, we moved to being a multi-platform operator um, across all three delivery platforms. And actually, you can see from the bar graph on the right, delivery stabilised at around 30% of sales. Um, so we, 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 we're feeling pretty shocked that the, um, the, the growth is coming from lots of different angles as, um, as, as a business. Moving on to some very positive things. Last year, we were sat here feeling a little bit glum, if you like, around cost pressures. It's a lot better now. Um, really pleased to report that food uh, pr pr um, Food inflation is much improved. You can see from this graph here that in the first couple of months of this year, when you were, uh, just to remind people that Ukraine war was the thing that really spiked inflation in Europe. So that kicked off in late February. So in the first couple of months of this year, we were lapping um, pre-war pre prices. So there was high inflation, but it's come right down. And very pleasingly, it's gone below 0% and into deflation. 
we're locked in some very good um, contract rates on proteins and that's hedged until the end of the year. And also on our fresh produce and dairy, and um, that's all protected until April next year. So there's some big savings coming through on gross margin because the, the, the you know our buying power has improved because we're a bigger business than we were 12 months ago, adding 18 sites last year. And we've worked tirelessly with our suppliers to find um, different ways of buying and, um, and changing what we do. So fantastic result. And, and similarly with utilities on the next page, we've been working with an energy broker to hedge our board prices. And that's resulted in a positive trend in terms of our utility prices. So we're feeling a lot, uh, uh, that not only is it going in the right direction in terms of prices, but the world of um, and utilities and food, it's a lot more stable than it was a year ago, which is fantastic in terms of obviously managing this business. Then coming on to an EBITDA bridge, which is important because the headline number obviously makes it look like um, the, the, the profit dropped uh, a lot year on year, but, but it didn't really in absolute terms. So last year we generated 2.5 million, but you can see the first two bars of that 0.8 on the VAT benefit, and there was some government support coming from business rates. So the total of those is 1.1 million. Um, there's Q1 basket inflation, so that, that downwards bar of 0.2 million is because obviously some of the Q1 last year was running at a, a favourable cost, cost rate on proteins and food. Obviously this year, a lot of the efforts that we've talked about in terms of margin improvement, they came later in, in the first half of the year, so sort of towards um, the end of May, early June. So then, you know, there's not much impact of those in the H1 numbers, but there is a bit, and you can see there's some margin improvement and underlying growth going up to generate our 1.8 million. So to that effect, in terms of the timing of a lot of these upsides, um, there's a normal sort of 40, 60 weighting of EBITDA generation for this business, you know, taking back a look at the last few years, back to 2018. On top of that, um, there's a 1.3 percentage point further improvement in the adjusted EBITDA margin from uh, the utilities, the food costs, and some savings that we've made in terms of our, our processes in the stores, which we'll come on to uh, later in the presentation. So we're feeling really good about those because they will obviously go a long way to improving our EBITDA generation in, in the rest of the year and, and, and beyond. Then just quickly onto the balance sheet before I hand back over to Richard. Balance sheet remains strong, uh, very minor net debt position of 1.6 million. Um, and I think with the EBITDA generation improvements we talked about, we'll be able to get back to our original principal IPO of a self-funded store rollout story um, next year and, and beyond. So that's been a key principle for us as a business. Um, we don't want to get into a heavy debt position given that debt markets are expensive now. Uh, and so to be in a, in a nice position like that puts us in a great, uh, a great position for the next year as well. Okay, moving on to um, uh, openings and sort of sites and the amounts of, uh, we put a little uh, box in the top corner here because it's quite confusing sometimes with a business like this. We've got a couple of brands, we've got some delivery kitchens and franchise sites in the UK and, and overseas. So. We put a, a, a box here that basically tells you where we're at by the 2nd of July of this year. I put um, 85 sites worldwide and franchising company owned. <coughs> and we've opened so far this year, uh, we've opened a site in Derby, in the Derby and Centre, which is a shopping centre in Derby. One thing we've definitely noticed since post COVID is that shopping centres, good shopping centres, have been performing exceptionally well. Um, and this one is no exception, so we were, we were delighted with the performance of Derby. Greenwich, um, a London site, a cracking London site, big student population, very heavy tourist area, offices, very busy, um, great site. We're, we're delighted to get that one, and that has opened already at sort of uh, mature sales. Um, so um, that's, been a, that's a great performer for us. And we opened a SSP franchise business at Manchester Piccadilly on the on the ticket line. Great site, very small site, but um, doing some good numbers out of there. So uh, another successful uh, SSP franchise business for us there. 
Uh, and as, as, we, as I mentioned earlier on, we've opened a couple since then, one in Belfast, which has been a fantastic success, and one in Bracknell, which is again in a very good shopping centre area, um, and after four to six weeks of trading, it's performing in line with expectations. So, so all good with the openings this year. Um, we have a couple more that we will open this year, a couple, of, a couple more company-owned sites. Um, so we will get we will be at eight openings this year. Now um, we discussed last year about doing between sort of ten to twelve sites, uh, but we also stated in this presentation that we we're going to take a bit of a view in the first quarter just to see, just get a sense of the market and see how things were and what you know how the kind of inflation was going and. And I think the first quarter was quite challenging. So whilst we didn't make a sort of considered effort not to open 10 sites, uh, we probably didn't push quite as hard. Um, and the reality is we do have a couple of sites that we could have probably opened this year, but we pushed them back to um, quarter one and quarter two for next year. Um, we, we also wanted to make sure that we got Chilangos right and we were, we, we, we'd embedded that into the business and we were getting the profit and, um, that business had been transported over to Tortilla well. Uh, but the reality is opening only eight as opposed to the 10 or 12 still keeps us well ahead of our expected target, which we stated at IPO. Um, and on the next slide, that kind of highlights that. But we stated at IPO, we'd open 45 sites in five years. <clears throat> so even allowing for the slight shortfall that last year, based on the 18 that we opened the previous year, we're still ahead of target and uh, assumed to be looking at um, over 100 sites by the full year end of 2026. Next year is looking very good and we're keen to find great sites. The property market, whilst perhaps not being as soft as it was immediately post COVID, is still uh, more favorable than pre COVID. So there are still some great sites for us to go for. Slight tweaks and changes in some of the areas and the focuses of where we're looking for sites. Um, obviously, you'll all be aware that the high streets have found life quite challenging post COVID. We've seen huge upturns in shopping center um, sales and travel locations and office places. So, we, we will continue to focus on those, still giving us a lot of white space in the UK and a lot, lot more university towns for us to continue to go to. So to that, to that end, we, we've got four pretty much locked and loaded already for next year. So I'm out and about with the property director, making sure that we find the rest of them for the rest of next year. Um, one, sorry, just one other thing. And we've talked a lot about how costs are starting to ease. One area that we have been pretty relentless about is build costs that have been spiraling out of control. I know in a lot of a lot of businesses and in a lot of areas uh, there's not been very much we can do about it but we've been quite creative in the way that we you know we're doing our new sites looking at different uh, materials um, and whilst it's been quite challenging we've managed to maintain our capex costs on our new sites and anticipate them certainly not going up uh, next year well let's, let's assume that's the case so we've managed to stabilize those costs um always interesting to share competition see what's going on both in the uk and in europe because obviously europe does become a higher focus for us um, as, as we as we move as we move the business forward um and the truth is nothing really changes um we are still noticeably somewhere ahead of our competitors in in the uk uh, there are a couple of those businesses beneath us that have been recently being bought by larger businesses, larger organisations that will have a, will no doubt have a, have a strategy to be growing those brands, otherwise I can't imagine why they bought them. <coughs> Barbarita has a plan to open sites up in the north of England, as yet that's not happened. Chipotle continue to open a few sites around the UK. Um, some strange decisions around locations from them, in our opinion. Um, but they are obviously the one that, uh, if they do decide to put the hammer down, then they can do. They are a you know, very, very wealthy business. Um, but as it currently stands, they're, they're still operating in locations where, that primarily we probably wouldn't choose to take. So um, they're still some way behind us. Boujum are a very successful Irish-Mexican, uh, Irish-Mexican, 
<laughs> a Mexican business from Ireland uh, that have been doing unbelievably well over there, which was one of the main reasons we went to Belfast to, to compete directly with them. Um, they have also been bought, they'll be coming over to the UK at some stage this year as well. Um, so we'll keep an eye out for them. And then the other two are more, I would say, Taco Bell style operators, not, not of the same sort of slightly more premium offer that, that the other ones are. So generally still in a position of strength. We don't want to lose that. We want to keep our foot down in the UK. Um, and that's why I'm keen to get very involved around the property for the next year. Uh, continental Europe, much the same. Uh, we have talked about it uh, as, a, as a strategy for us, and, and I think even more so, we want to be able to um, get involved in Europe. We think there's a massive opportunity there. We always have. Uh, it feels similarly similar to the UK 10 or 15 years ago, or maybe longer ago, when Brandon started this business. There were quite a few runners and riders at the beginning. Um, and with the obvious exception of Tortilla, most of them were not really particularly great. Um, and I'd probably say that's much the same in Europe. There's a lot of small businesses um, with upwards, maybe up to 10, 12 company owned sites. Um, so there's a massive consolidation opportunity in Europe. Uh, and we really feel like we, we are now in a position to, to take full advantage of that opportunity and uh, we are continuing to pursue that. So just to talk a little bit around the, the new stores and just to give you an update on those that we opened last year and those that we've opened this year. So I guess the, one of the key things to flag is that there's a much improved picture to present around the fixed costs part of the Tortier business. So from a rent perspective, as a percentage of sales, uh, the openings of this year and last year and the Chilango acquisition, the rent as a percentage of sales is lower than the pre-FY22 um, opening. So um, what, we're, what, we're, what that's saying is we're still able to get deals on new sites that are, that are favourable to the sites that we had pre-COVID. And, and I think that's, you know, that's a trend that's, that's very much here at the moment. And there, there are lots of additional opportunities, like Richard said, to keep acquiring sites at favourable rent levels. Something to flag, which is often overlooked, obviously business rates is, is almost 50% of, of the bill that you pay in um, rents each year. And actually business rates moved favourably earlier in the year as the valuation office redid the business rates regime in April. And that saw a 14% reduction for us in our rates bill uh, versus the year before. So from a fixed cost point of view, um, things are looking very, very good. And similarly, in terms of our new store openings, things are looking very good. The sites we opened last year are largely on track. Um, you know, there's some smaller towns that we opened last year, and we did want to flag that. They do continue to grow. It takes a bit longer for the sites to hit maturation in some of these smaller cities. Um, you know, there's a graph at the bottom there that just shows you the growth of some of these older sites over the years. The good thing about the Tortier model is, is it, is it, is it continues to grow for many years after opening as, as people understand more about Mexican food. This is a new concept, burritos as a, as a concept in a lot of these smaller cities. Um, as people try the food and word of mouth spreads, um, the sales grow. And that's what we're seeing, that exact same trend that we've seen over the years, over the last 10, 50 years is exactly what we're seeing in these new stores. Um, and so we're really encouraged by how well we've started in those locations already. Um, and, and, and actually the Chilango estate, which, which Richard's going to come on to in terms of new store openings, is performing very well as well. So we're, we're feeling very positive about the, the UK wide space opportunity overall. Just to flag, um, it's nice to put a picture against some of our new store openings. We, um, since we, we um, updated at the year end, opened a couple of sites since Belfast and Bracknell and there's pictures here. The capex costs, as Richard said, have remained relatively low and they're, well, they're quite stable at the, the level they're at. But encouragingly, Belfast, having only been open for a couple of months, is already ahead of its investment case maturity sales level. Investment case maturity sales level, just to remind you, is the sales level that you need to hit a 30% return on capital employed, which is the company's key financial hurdle that we uh, make investment decisions against. 
and Bracknell um, similarly um, has started very strongly. Um, it's close to its maturity sales level. Um, and you know, it's again, it's only been open a couple of months and we've been really encouraged by how well um, burritos have been received by that local market. It's in a great shopping center and um, we think it's a strong site as well. So um, we're really encouraged with the, with the openings from this year. And although the numbers are not up here, obviously Derby um, and um, Greenwich that we open open in the year, it's a similar story with those sites as well. Um, this is a very exciting slide for, for me to present because there were quite a few eyebrows raised when we um, looked at buying this business um, at a time when there were genuine concerns about working from home and should you be investing in a central London business at this stage. Uh, I think we as, as a team, as a board, have always been very pro-London. We were always of the opinion that it would come back to 80, 85, 90 percent of its previous sales. It's a very, it's a very buoyant city and always has been. We always believed that Chilango was quite a good um, competitor of ours, one of the best. So it gave us an opportunity to take them um, out of the game or certainly control that business. Um, and we got it for a very good price, we felt. What's been really encouraging is there was some concern around rebranding them to Tortilla. Would that work? Would people feel very disappointed about Chilango, etc.? Well, the actual the actual truth is that our sales since we converted these five sites to Tortilla are, are circa thirty percent up um, versus um, the back end of their time as Chilango. So hugely successful acquisition for us and we're incredibly proud of what we've managed to achieve there and so subsequently the return on capital on that business has been fantastic and we would anticipate hopefully that we'd be we'd be almost up at circa 800 million pounds of EBITDA at these Chilango sites so real tick in the box for us for, 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 for many reasons not just that we've managed to to do this and it shows the strength of the tortilla brand but it shows that as a business, we're able to do an acquisition and we're able to do it well. Um, so if other opportunities presented themselves, whether they be here or, or, or even perhaps abroad, that really gives us the confidence of knowing that Tortier can go into these spaces and perform substantially better than the previous tenants. Um, what we've also done is, because still, we still have three locations trading as Chilangos, because they were, they were so close to existing tortilla sites. So we've kept those businesses going, they continue to perform well, uh, and we've actually put Chilango back into the delivery network at our Croydon Box Park location, which we did convert back to tortilla. Um, but we wanted to see whether brand recognition in a certain area would work, and we have a facility there to, have, to put Chilango back in, and that's been a real success. Uh, our delivery sales out of that business have grown substantially and a lot of people are ordering Chilango off there. So we're about to do the same in Manchester, which was an ex-Chilango site. So we're keeping the brand alive through delivery and then we're able to do it out of our tortilla kitchen. So it's a it's a win-win there. And franchising, another successful time for us with franchising. Um, obviously, all the doom and gloom around travel has completely cleared away now. Uh, everybody is traveling, it seems that way anyway. Um, certainly by looking at our numbers that we have in our tortilla locations in travel hubs and airports, uh, our Houston tortilla, which is a franchise, is just breaking sales records all the time, as is Gatwick Airport tortilla and Bristol Airport tortilla. So um, again, really good news for us with our relationship with SSP. Um, they're very keen to continue to grow with us. There are a few more locations that we're doing. We're doing one more with them this year, and then we've got a couple more early next year that, that we're doing. Um, very good relationship with SSP, and we would like them to do things quicker. We, we'd like them to open more, um, as is the case sometimes with these enormous businesses. They are quite slow to get things done, but uh, they, they love Tortilla. It's a very profitable business for them, so we are... Um, anticipating continued strong relationships with them. Um, Ethos over in the Middle East continues to operate eight tortilla sites, operating them very well. 
Uh, we sent one of our operations guys out to oversee and run that business on their behalf about a year ago. He's done a phenomenal job, and it's now their most successful like-for-like -like business within their portfolio, within our franchise company's portfolio. So we're now pushing them hard to continue to grow the brand in the Middle East, in Dubai and Abu Dhabi. Um, we're hoping that they'll have a couple of sites signed um, by the end of this year, ready for a mid to late next year um, openings. But certainly the confidence around the brand has grown dramatically in the last 12 months. Our like for likes of double digit over there, which is fantastic. <clears throat> um, Compass continue to operate um, our businesses in university um, halls, which are performing very, very well. Uh, in fact, I was looking last week, I think it's only the second week, all the students are back, the numbers are really, really encouraging. Uh, and again, we've then a bit of a slow, uh, a slow mover compass. We're hoping to open more sites for them um, and we'll continue to work with them and hopefully that will happen. Um, moving on to areas where we've been trying to drive the top line, I mean, Andy's been talking a lot it's almost been a game of two halves for us this year. First, first quarter, we were, we were all about, right, what do we need to do to be more profitable? What do we need to do to sharpen up our cost lines? What do we need to do on our P&L to, to, to utilize our size and work with our suppliers to get the benefits of pricing? We've done a pretty phenomenal job on that. And, and as Andy's already said, we're going to see some, well, we are already seeing some some pretty good movement on our uh, on our margin for the, for the last half so in the next quarter of this year and going forward so that's great news but clearly any business needs to be driving the top line because the top line is really where where it all comes from so um we've we've put in some tech which we were keen to do we've been keen to do for a while especially in some of these central london sites where we have enormous queues for two two and a half hours every single lunchtime and the challenge with a single line concept like ours is just simply getting people through um, and as quick as we can be on a single line realistically it's still relatively slow process if you join the queue at the back you know you're probably 15 20 minutes by the time you, you're done most people are, are pretty happy to, to do that but we think we can improve we thought we can improve our throughput by adding kiosks and adding two more lines which we've done in london wall so we have in effect got three tortilla lines in there now and eight kiosks so we've got six people producing food on three lines and we've got eight customers being able to order at exactly the same time. It does take away the, the kind of customer interaction and you're not walking along a line and picking and choosing what you want. You are doing that via a kiosk. The reality is this has been unbelievably successful. Um, our hourly sales records are increased by nearly 40%. Almost every day we're doing, um, we're breaking sales records simply because the consumer is getting more comfortable at using our kiosks, they're getting quicker at them, and we're getting food out of the kitchen within a minute and a half from somebody pressing send. Um, so it's, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty awesome setup, actually. And this is generating real extra revenue for us in this store. And there are a couple of other sites in central London where we will almost certainly be putting kiosks in. Um, so very exciting for us. And, uh, you know, the way forward in very, very high volume locations. <clears throat> we continue to push our loyalty. We're, we're over 350,000 people are on our loyalty app now, so that's fantastic. So we're able to talk to them, communicate with them, and let them know of all the things that we're doing. Uh, we have had this new product um, that, that Andy, I think, mentioned when he was talking about things we've done to improve profitability. We put a chicken pibble, bis uh, chicken pibble offer into our restaurants now, taking away our char grilled chicken, saving us a lot of money in utility costs, uh, cleaning costs, and labor costs. This is a fantastic product. Um, consumers love it, uh, but it's, it's, it's a win for the consumer, and it's also a win for us as a business in terms of um, costs. So really pleased that that's gone in. Um, and the really big thing that I've been excited to talk about over the last few weeks to everybody and anybody who's prepared to listen is about Tortilla Sunsets. We are really getting right behind this promotion. This is very exciting for us. I think it's a genius idea. We have a business that performs tremendously well at lunch times, um, but we are relatively quiet in the evenings other than delivery. So based on the fact that we have employees on our business, 
looking after some guests and a lot of delivery. We really want to reverse that a little bit by looking after a lot of guests in our businesses because we have lovely restaurants um, and we've put together an offer that we think is sensational. Well, well, it is sensational. We're selling margaritas and beers for £2.50. I'm not, I, I can't remember the last time I had a beer for £2.50. <laughs> so there's no way in London and the rest of the country you can get these quality of drinks for that sort of price. That's the hook. That gets people into the business, and then we're selling them our new menu items, which are, which are fantastic. We've got some sweet corn ribs, we've got sharing quesadillas, we've got some nachos, we've got a cheese and chorizo dip. So there's a fantastic menu now. We're serving our food in, 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 in plates and crockery, real crockery, not just, not just sort of in bowls that we do at lunchtime. So we're really trying to create a restaurant feel with really good value food. Everybody who eats out now, everyone knows how expensive it is to eat out. All our competitors in, in all aspects of this sector have had to put their prices up, which is understandable. If you go out to a rel relatively mid-range casual dining restaurant and you have a bottle of wine and a couple of courses, you're almost at 40, 50 pounds a head now. That's a lot of money. Uh, and we're able to offer this 10 pound menu with a beer or a margarita and it's quality food you know all our food is made fresh etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's all about getting the message out there um i'm shouting and screaming it we've even sent megaphones to all the restaurants so at five o'clock we're encouraging the managers to be shouting out come and get your beers and your margaritas for 250. so early signs are very strong for us the first couple of weeks we've seen some increase in numbers and of course majority of that in student locations um, but it's over to everybody and anybody. So um, please, for those of you that haven't been yet, please give it a go because it's a fabulous offer. Spread the word. Yes, indeed. So on to value for money, which is something we, we talk about each time, but it's important just to reiterate, particularly with the cost of living crisis and the, the, the carefulness with which people are looking after their cash. Um, we have priced once this year in late March, coinciding with the increase in the minimum wage. Uh, we It blends at 5%, but we did uh, more in London, central London, 7%, and 3% outside of London, because we felt that the cost of living crisis from the data that we saw was being more acutely felt outside of London. So strategically, that felt like the right thing to do. And in our products for a regular burrito, um, outside of London is only seven pounds twenty. So, you know, a lot of pubs now a pint costs seven pounds twenty. So it's a very, very good price product. We know that price is important to our product, our customers. Um, we've redone some research and surveys with our customers that we did previously, and good good value remains really important to them. And we know we're well priced compared to our peers, as this graph shows against our direct Mexican and California Mexican competition, but also against businesses like Itzu, Wasabi, Leon, um, and some of the burger businesses. We we sit in a really nice sweet spot where we're not as cheap and clearly the product is very different to the QSR segment, the Taco Bell, Nanda, uh, uh, McDonald's, KFC type businesses, but we sit cheaper than sushi, um, Poke bowls and some of the burger businesses. So it's a nice spot to sit. And obviously, although it's not mentioned on here, the, the food is healthy and customization with food is, is very much on trend. Um, and those remain important principles for us. To just give a few points before Richard wraps up around current trading and outlook. So since the end of the first half here, we, as I mentioned, we have opened in Belfast and Bracknell. Trading remains good over the summer. Uh, August was a slightly quieter month because the weather was not very good and lots of people did leave the country uh, for overseas holidays. But actually over July, August and September, there's been some positive like likes. Um, and a favorable cost environment is probably the most significant point. As I mentioned earlier in the presentation, that will yield a 1.3 percentage point improvement in our adjusted EBITDA margin in the second half of the year on top of, as I said, the normal seasonality uh, that you get with EBITDA generation. 
uh, that's coming mainly from supply chain, utility costs, from locked in contracts, so there's no, no risk to that. Uh, and then also the launch of the new product, as Richard mentioned, it's produced our manual labour um, and, and some other costs within our stores. We're launching these exciting initiatives, which, which um, are already yielding some um, positive progress. And we obviously want to continue progressing our technology initiatives. And we've got some other ideas as to things we can do on that front as well, having appointed a, um, an experienced head of IT earlier in the year. So we've got lots of good, exciting ideas there. And lastly, we're, we're continuing to assess our European opportunities through franchising and or strategic acquisitions, as we as we've referred to earlier in the deck. And you know, there's a there's a tremendous opportunity in Europe to create a consolidated um, uh, Mexican bit burrito business. You know, there's plenty of pizza and burrito businesses in Europe, and um, you know, the customization of what we do and the healthiness of it. Burritos are burrito businesses are growing in, across all, all countries in, in on the continent. Um, so coming to the end, really, this is just a, a you know, slide to give a, a, a really a little bit of the sort of strategic levers that we, we believe this business has for next year and, and kind of ongoing, really. We, we're keen to do the 8 to 12 openings per annum. We, we feel like the world is turning slightly more favourably, so we do want to keep pushing hard on that. The UK is still our core business, and we still see lots of opportunities, so we want to carry on doing that. We do gen genuinely believe there's a unique opportunity to consolidate in Europe. Enough said, we've talked a lot about that. Franchising, we now have a very, very good franchising business. We spent a while making sure we were nailing our central production processes. We have a cracking CPU now that's very well-oiled and well-run and a great product. Um, we have franchise procedures in place for this business now, so it's, we're ready to really press the button on franchising more. Um, presumably around Europe, but who's to say that won't happen more in, in, in the UK, but for the moment, that's more of a European idea. Um, something Andy and I have talked a lot about, but I think for us as a business and where we sit now and the size of the business that we're at, I think it's really important that we are striving to get back to our, you know, adjusted EBITDA, corporate EBITDA of sort of 10% uh, that we were running at pre-COVID. I mean, clearly we've been battered with all sorts of headwinds and this business perhaps more affected than most because it's such a heavy protein-led business. Um, we've worked incredibly hard to get ourselves back to a place of parity, but I think next year we want to really push on with that and see if we can get back to, to, to sort of 17, 18% story with Dar and 10% corporate with Dar. So that's, a, that's something we're striving to achieve. Technology. We talked about kiosks early days, but very successful, will really drive, drive sales and efficiencies for us. Um, and I think we're also a business that's at a size where we really need to be punching a bit harder on our marketing um, budgets, spending a little bit more net money on that, maybe some national marketing next year. You know, we're not a small business anymore. We're the largest Mexican business, and we've got you know, we're going to have 70, 80 sites in the UK pretty soon. So. It's pretty important that we're, we're shouting and screaming about how good we are. Some, in some cases, I, I feel like we're, we're under, under marketing ourselves. So something we want to plan for next year. So in summary, I feel like I've written a sentence about four times over the last couple of years, despite all continued headwinds. <laughs> but despite all continued headwinds, um, we're delighted to be broadly in line with our, our full year numbers. Um, we will continue to drive forward with our sales through kiosks, uh, improved and, um, delivery software, and as the Pied Piper of the Sunsets Initiative, we will continue to push very hard on that over the, over the coming months. Um, yes, there is a little bit of an air of slight concern. I mean, obviously, these train strikes are very disruptive in many different ways. Uh, we are anticipating and hoping that there will be some kind of resolution to this. I, I, I can't believe that they'll continue in December as they did last year, but there is an element of risk around that. We certainly hope that's not the case. Um, there is good progress being made on our site openings. We're still on track to hit our target of 45 sites over five years. I think strengthening the board is always a great thing. We have a fantastic board, a very strong operational board, a strong marketing team, finance team. Um, and we also have Francesca sitting on our board, who, who's CFO in um, a 
KFC over in Europe, so a real help to us with our European strategy. And now with Andy moving up to MD as well, that's a, that's a, that's a great move for us. Um, and I think, again, as I say at, at the end of all these presentations, we, we, we really continue to be very, very excited. We feel like we keep getting stunted by various events, macroeconomics that sort of slightly hold us back. But we've got the foundations in place in this business now to, to really let it rip. And that's, uh, and that's the intention both in the UK and in Europe over the, uh, over the coming years. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Perfect. Richard, Andy, if I may just jump back in there. Thank you very much indeed for your presentation this afternoon. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions just by using the Q&A tab that's situated on the right hand corner of your screen. Uh, but just while the team take a few moments to review those questions that were submitted already, I would like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A can be accessed via your investor dashboard. Um, Andy, Richard, as you can see, we have received a number of questions uh, throughout your presentation this afternoon and given the significant number of questions received you may not be able to get through um, them all now but of course immediately after the presentation we'll give you back all of the questions and any you don't manage to get through we can add additional responses to post the meeting and we'll publish all of those on the platform um, but for now uh, Richard and if I could just ask you just to make your way through that Q&A tab and give your responses where it's appropriate to do so and then I'll pick up from you at the end thank you okay Right, well, Paul S., thank you very much for that. And um, we do own Chilango, so that's good. I'm sorry that you consider them to be <laughs> better, but actually maybe I'm not because um, we, we, we love Chilango as well. We think they're it's fantastic, so um, fair comment. Uh, uh, are we considering raising more equity to finance growth acquisitions? At this stage, probably can't really answer that. Um, I think it's probably unlikely, the stage we're at, uh, <laughs> with the business in its current state. Uh, with, with regards to the share price. I think um, our preferences would be, if we were to do anything though, is promote money. Obviously we've still got 7 million undrawn on our debt facility. So if we need to access that, that's clearly the um, preferable route than, um, than raising money in the, in the current in the current climate. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, do you want to take the rock? So if there's a question here around, can you share some details about how you calculate the rookie? So we calculate simply, we just take the capital costs that we incurred. So we were at Recollect, we were saying we were spending around 400 to 425,000 on a new site. We take the EBITDA uh, at maturity um, and whatever that EBITDA is a percentage of the growth of, of, the, of the capex needs to be more than 30%. So yeah, that's a mature, mature EBITDA, which for businesses in London happens within 12 months. Outside of London, it's more like 24 months, depending on the, on the location. Okay. Um, what's the, uh, a point of clarification, is the intention going forward to fund expansion internally? Yes. Yeah, I would say so. Yeah. And then do you have something you can share regarding the return on investment on the kiosks? We needed to generate an extra 800 pounds a week from the kiosks in order to return the capital expenditure. Um, we're generating 1200 quid a week extra and we're only five weeks in. So that was the, um, that was the, the kind of main hurdle we were working on towards that. You keep referring to yourself as prop. Oh, yeah, that's very funny, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, obviously, a rollout story like ours, you have got the depreciation on your stores, um, and that is always something to consider. Um, but we believe that the right strategy for the business is to continue growing um, and continue to um, pursue growth. And, you know, the profitability challenges we've had over the 12 months, obviously, a lot of them are being alleviated. So we, we, we can see that coming back nicely in, in sort of future periods. Um, I wanted to ask about the new openings in full year 23 in March, the announcement target was 10 to 12, and it seems you will end the year at 8 instead. Can you speak to the challenges of opening new sites that prevented the earlier target? Well, I think I sort of highlighted that, that yes, that's correct, that was the target. I think we also stated that we wanted to be very sure that um, we wanted to check the sort of sentiments of the market at, the, at that particular time. 
Uh, we didn't want to draw down too much debt to do that. We wanted to make sure that we were um, in a place to open that many sites whilst we were still in the process of dealing with Chilango. As it turns out, we'll end up opening eight, which is a little less than we'd hoped, but it is still keeping us on track with our 45 sites over five years. So we don't consider that to be a, a massive shortfall. And I think, as I stated earlier, we did have a couple of sites that we could have pushed into this year, but we felt like we were happy to move them out to next year. So um, there's nothing suspicious about it. It was just something we felt was probably the right thing to do last year. There's a question from Connor around our intention to franchise in Europe and, and how we're set up for that. So you're right, we obviously do not have any stores at present within continental Europe, but obviously we've proven the concept outside of Europe with our presence in the Middle East. The franchise model, there's some very exciting synergies to be had from franchising in Europe, not least because most of our supply chain, the food comes from Europe already, so through Europe into the UK. So there would be some interesting synergies to access in terms of um, potentially having a CPU presence in Europe and supplying our food to franchise partners in different European countries that way. Um, we, 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 they're, although they're relatively small businesses, there has been some moderately successful growth stories in different European countries selling similar you know, burritos and, and tacos like we do. And um, having tasted the competition's products, we, we think what we do is, 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 is better. And so actually there's some structural advantages as well with European countries where the rents can be lower. And actually the VAT rate on hot food is uh, as low as sort of uh, sub 10%. So with a 20% rate in the UK, we, we do have a bit of a disadvantage here. So we're, we're quite excited by the opportunity to, uh, to make it work in, um, in different uh, countries. At what store level do you need to open another central operated kitchen? It's a good question. The changes that we made with our chicken pibble process has um, brought us more time in terms of our current unit. Um, as we just talked about with Europe, any central operated kitchen, we wouldn't supply that from the UK. We would open something overseas and do it that way. So the key there is getting enough critical mass of presence to justify uh, the capital expenditure required to build that kitchen. Re not selling tacos on delivery. Yes, I would have to say the reason we don't is from a, is a quality issue. Um, you're warming some flour tortillas and suddenly, uh, you know, when they're not wrapped up like burritos are wrapped in silver foil, that, that, that can, can, they can get very sticky. Um, they're not the easiest things in the world to eat. Um, and certainly after a, after a journey on a bike, um, <laughs> tend not to look particularly wonderful um, on arrival. That's not to say that we're not trying to find ways of doing that. We know they're very popular. We, 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 we're always looking at better ways of packaging our food from a delivery and a takeaway perspective. Uh, and that is one of the one of the areas that we're looking at for those, for those products. Okay. Um... Right, which one next? Um, in terms of a rewards membership, are there any plans to build an app? Um, obviously, there are bigger businesses like Starbucks and Greg's. I think the so the view on apps is quite mixed. Yeah. Um, I think there is a, a view that people are a bit fed up of apps and there's too many of them. App fatigue. Uh, app fatigue. Um, it's something we're looking at. I mean, obviously, we, as I said in, uh, in the presentation, we do have a, a new head of IT, and we are we are reviewing lots of different sort of tech options for us. Definitely, there's more opportunity with kiosks, and obviously, the thing that we did in terms of built, putting in some delivery application software that's those things that were the obvious low lying fruit for us. But of course, things like apps and other ways that we can get consumers not just via apps, but to click and collect. You know, can we try and push more of the orders to come in? Um, people just come in and pick them up rather than queuing. There's lots of opportunity on, on that type of thing as people get used to the idea of, of, uh, of ordering in advance. Um, so just looking at there's some duplication in terms of uh, um, questions here. When you calculate the return on capital, do you calculate the same? What would be your profitability? Um, Obviously, there's a there's a view here that adjusted EBITDA isn't a not, isn't a uh, a real number. 
Um, I mean, I guess the reality is adjusted EBITDA for us is the most equivalent way of looking at the underlying results, you know, removing the noise. Um, clearly, obviously, you, you would always look at your depreciation and amortization, but as long as you're keeping your depreciation policy unchanged and you're keeping your capital costs down, that's the best way to sort of performance assess um, things that happen below the line. Um, we include all our capital costs in our Roki calculations. Um, so we, we believe we're looking at a proper sort of returns exercise um, when, we're, when we're reviewing our, our new site expenditure. And then there's a question around how we fund in your CapEx. Um, we will fund our CapEx from our own cash. As we mentioned there, we've only got a very minor net debt position, although we do have further debt facility for us to draw on when our profitability comes back, as we've explained the reasons why it will, um, we will return to a position where we can um, we can fund from our, from our own cash. Okay, that's, uh, we can't really talk about acquisition oh, talks. Uh, Con Connor's noted that eight three burritos from Tortilla this week, the pibble is 10 out of 10, well, that's, that's good to hear. <laughs> Thanks Connor, I'll give you the, I'll give you the 10 pounds next time I see you. <laughs> That's great. Um, with Torte Entertain Acquisition uh, Talks, I mean, we obviously can't really talk about that. I mean, clearly, uh, with our share prices depressed as it is, that, um, any, yeah, we, we, we're significantly undervalued in, in our opinion in terms of a, a multiple of EBITDA. Um, how confident is the management team in the future of the business? Is the management adding shares to their personal portfolio? Would be great shareholder alignment. There's a, a very good chunk of shares still held by the management team. And obviously we have uh, an exec team um, with, with, with an LTIP and everyone is incentivized to drive the business. And, and, and you know, we've got very young, excited, driven people in the organization. We feel very confident about their, their alignment with shareholders i think that's that's it Rich, richard andy absolutely and thank you very much indeed for addressing all of those questions that came in from investors this afternoon and of course if any further questions do come through we'll make these available to you immediately after the presentation has ended uh, just for you to review to then add any additional responses of course where it's appropriate to do so um but richard perhaps before really just looking to redirect those on the call to provide you with their feedback which i know is particularly important to yourself and the company if i could please just ask you for a few closing comments just to wrap up with that'd be great um well I, I think you know when i read when i go through this 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 presentation and I've, we've, as you can imagine we've been through it quite a lot and we, we've spent some time putting it together the, the overriding view is this is a this is this is a great business that's been you know hit by external scenarios that were really outside of our control we've worked incredibly hard to get ourselves back to a place of um, profitability we're re really excited about certainly in the next few months and we think we've got a couple of great things going on to drive the top line in the business. We've got a very stable senior management team in this business who absolutely love it. I mean, kind of, you know, we were all out and about last night. Again, all the senior guys, a lot of office people out in their stores talking about sunsets, giving feedback. There's a genuine determination in the company to, to do absolutely the very best we can. And it's wonderful to be around um, such a committed bunch because you have to be in this in this in this industry at the moment it's challenging um yes it's a little frustrating that the, the markets are a little against us but it is what it is we just we just carry on doing and, and taking responsibility for what we can do uh and i'm and i'm very comfortable that that's exactly what we are doing uh and we believe that as things start to ease that, that all the hard work we've done in the last six to twelve months will, will really reap some rewards for us so um yeah, that's it. Just thank, thanks very much for your time today. And hopefully as you as you reflect on the presentation, you'll think, actually, do you know what? This is this is good this is good business. Um, because we really think it is. That's great. Richard, Andy, thank you once again for updating investors this afternoon. Could I please ask investors not to close this session as you'll now be automatically redirected for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. 
On behalf of the management team of Tortilla Mexican Grill PLC, we would like to thank you for attending today's presentation. That now concludes today's session, so good afternoon to you all.